is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The billionaire investor as you've never seen him before. Howard Marks joins us on Skype from his LA home. Uh, you know, this is this is an interesting times, uh, challenging but challenging but stimulating. Decades of experience and a unique investing philosophy. I don't uh, believe in forecasts, including my own. The one thing you should believe in to help you ride out crises. I believe in、uh, cycles, and I believe that we always will have cycles. In these troubling times, find the true essence of investing with Oak Tree Capital co-founder and co-chairman Howard Marks. Only on Biz Talk. Only on CGTN. Hello and welcome to this episode of Biz Talk. I'm Chen Lei in Beijing. Global markets have gone through wild times due to fears about the coronavirus pandemic. Is it time to buy, sell, or hold? How do you remain disciplined and true to your investment philosophy? Joining us on the line from his Los Angeles home and in casual dress is our special guest, Mr. Howard Marks, legendary investor, co-chairman, and co-founder of Oak Tree Capital. And yes, he will be talking on an old-fashioned phone. Very old school for these unusual times. Nobody's seen anything like it. Multiple markets limit down, triggering trading halts. Panic spreading around the world like the coronavirus, fast and wide. Even as governments scramble to cut rates and issue stimulus, including the U.S. trillion-dollar emergency aid, the ECB's 750 billion euro package. Investors stay wary. We've seen these wild times in global markets, Howard. Right now, what's your guess about the coronavirus pandemic? You've said that the sell-off is probably sixty percent over. Does that still hold? Well, I would think that for a major、uh, decline, I would think that fifty or sixty percent would be the right number. It's been a substantial decline. Of course, it could go further,、uh, but I would imagine that uh, uh, a sub a substantial part of the damage has been done. So, how does the pandemic change U.S. economic fundamentals? Well, in the in the very、uh, immediate future, the growth will be curtailed,、um, perhaps in the first quarter, certainly in a substantial way in the second quarter, and perhaps in the third. Most people are acting under the assumption、uh, that it will、uh, be over in three or six months.、Uh, I don't have an opinion on that subject; merely a hope that it's true. In the meantime, lots of businesses will suffer. Many will close. A lot of people will lose their jobs and will suffer.、Um, and、uh, that's very unfortunate.、Uh, done in the short run.、Um, in the long run. If if it is six three to six months,、uh, then the、uh, economy will recover. I don't really have、uh, an opinion on how long the pandemic will last or、uh, the shape of the recovery. So now we're hearing about trillion dollar stimulus package from the U.S. government. Is it economically sound? Can the U.S. afford it? You know, the question of what we can afford has、uh, evaporated. In recent years, <laughs>、uh, historically,、uh, stimulus, be it monetary or fiscal, has、uh, been applied primarily during recessions. Thanks to the tax bill that was signed in December of 17, we're now running a trillion-dollar deficit、uh, during prosperity. Of course, in a crisis like this, nobody is concerned with、uh, the risk that the stimulus is excessive. You know, I'm from the school that believes that there is such a thing as having too much deficit and too much debt,、uh, but nobody, including me,、uh, can tell you when that point is reached. 
Even when it seems no investment is safe, we should remember tides always turn. Uh, Black Monday, uh, uh, October 19th, 1987, they were supposed to put in sell orders, so they called the brokers in the days of telephones, and the brokers didn't pick up the phone. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business. Only on CGTN. coronavirus crash follows a string of market crises. The 2008 global financial crisis, the 1997 Asian financial crisis, and the 1987 crash. Surviving these periods of severe shock takes acumen, discipline, and luck. For Howard Marks, who pioneered distressed debt investing, there are opportunities in every downturn. Share with us some anecdotes from the great crash of Black Monday in 87 and also the market turmoil in 2008. Yes. Well, you know, uh, Black Monday, you know, we, we talk about the stock market being down uh, 6%, 8%. We talk about being down 15% or 20% in a bad year. How about being down 23, 24% in one day? That's what we had on Black Monday. It happens that in 1987, uh, it, there was excessive belief in something called portfolio insurance, which was a technique that was supposed to let you make money when the market goes up and not lose money when the market goes down, which is, of course, this dream that people pursue, even though it's illogical that it should exist. Anyway, there was excessive belief in portfolio insurance that allowed people to take on more portfolio risk than they thought they should because the portfolio insurers promised them that they would always get them out in time. And it happens that when the market was down so much on Black Monday, it was very simple. People were supposed to ex implement sell orders in order to, uh, in order for portfolio insurance to work. They were supposed to put in sell orders. So they called the brokers in the days of telephones and the brokers didn't pick up the phone. It's as simple as that. So that's quite a recollection. And it reminds one how uh, the things that are supposed to work don't always work. Now, when you ask about uh, the global financial crisis in 08, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, of course, it, it's uh, fresher in my memory than, uh, than uh, 33 years ago. And it was also, I would say, more profound. In October 08, when the fear of the meltdown was the greatest, um, I couldn't satisfy people. They always, no matter it, what conservative assumption I made, they always said, no, that's not conservative enough. And I reached the conclusion that when optimism is excessive, my job is to say that's too good to be true. When pessimism is, is excessive, it's my job to say that's too bad to be true. And that's how we've made money in the crises. And, uh, you know, when I reached that uh, conclusion in 08, I ran back to my office, as you know, because you've read my books, and I wrote a memo called The Limits to Negativism. And I said, you know, uh, negativism is excessive, which means that we should move into an aggressive gear, and we did. Yeah, okay. I have your book right here. <laughs> Good, okay. <laughs> Your memo, Nobody Knows It Too. The last time this title was used was in 2008, in September. Why is it important to admit sometimes that nobody knows? By the way, your questions are very good questions and I'm enjoying answering them. Oh, thank you. Uh, the American author and humorist Mark Twain said, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just isn't true. It's hard to get into big trouble when you 
state a statement which begins with, I could be wrong, but, or I don't know, but. It's when people say, I'm sure of this, or I can't miss with that. That's when they take bold actions where if their statements were wrong, that's when you lose a lot. So you can't be a successful investor if you don't have great knowledge and you have to know what you know. But if you can't be a consistently successful investor if you don't know what you don't know. I think that this is uh, one of the things that people uh, miss in, in uh, the investing business. Even in times of global gloom, visionary investors do not lose sight of the long-term bets that could pay off big. Good companies will have tough times in the short run, uh, will have difficulty financing. We believe that we will have opportunities uh, to buy uh, the distressed debt of good companies. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business, only on CGTN. Companies take advantage of record low interest rates to load up on debt. When times get tough, revenues dry up, and companies may struggle to roll over their debt. Corporate debt defaults during recession spell opportunities for distressed debt investors like Howard Marks. So would you say that the coming months are a golden opportunity to buy distressed assets, that is, good company, bad balance sheets? Well. You've been reading our our materials. Uh, we've been in the business, my partner Bruce Karsh and I, of investing in good companies with bad balance sheets for 33 years. Uh, and we've lived through three crises, which have given us the opportunity to do so, and the results have been uh, very successful. Uh, we believe that this uh, episode will give us another such opportunity. And uh, under the, assu the assumption that the economy eventually recovers, which I think is a good uh, assumption, uh, that should be profitable. I mean, investors go into markets thinking the priority is to make money, but the investing greats tend to also emphasize survival, especially under negative circumstances. So is it time that people go back to your books and revisit those chapters about ensuring survival? Well, you know what? Let me, let me just point one thing out. It's about both. It's easy to make money, but if you invest too riskily, you may not survive. It's easy to ensure that you will always survive, but then you might be invested so conservatively that you rarely make money. The key to success is to establish a portfolio so that if the market goes up, you will make money. And if the market goes down, you will survive. With five decades of experience in investing and as a pioneer of distressed debt, what's been your proudest moment and your biggest regret? I'm very proud of uh, what Bruce Karsh and I and the people of Oak Tree have been able to accomplish in the crises. I think that this episode will uh, present another opportunity to do so. And I, I hope our response will be a good one. What do I regret? One of the things that has permitted me that success and Bruce and Oak Tree is the fact that we're warriors and we're unemotional and we're analytical. And we, we have been able to swing into action in the crises and our crisis period funds have rewarded that. I guess what I would regret is having not having been more aggressive in between. Um, but as a uh, congenital warrior, uh, maybe that's asking too much. It's paid off extremely well in the crises, but of course, it's not going to pay off all the time.
Cycles are one of the most important things in the world of investing. They have an enormous impact on people's psyches and on the markets that determine our opportunities. The, the cycle in credit availability is affected by the cycle in psychology, but it also affects uh, the cycle in corporate behavior, and, and I think that's just one, one tiny example. So w we want to take advantage of cycles. We believe there will be cycles. We don't know when. You observe and write about cycles at length. We've seen the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and now this pandemic. Each time in the lead up, people still think this time it's different. Why? Well, uh, I believe in uh, cycles. In other words, things will go well. They'll reach a point beyond which they can't get better. And by definition, they'll start to get worse. And then things will deteriorate, and then they'll reach a point beyond which they can't get worse, and then they'll get better. That's the belief of someone who some who 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 follows cycles. And as you know, that that's me. I've lived through uh, half a dozen uh, cycles, substantial economic and market cycles in my 51 years in the investment business, and I believe that we always will have cycles. The interesting thing, if you if you pay attention, is that when things have gone very well for a long time, people start to say, well, maybe we won't have any more cycles. Maybe it's going to go straight up forever. And of course, that is the exact time when the probability of a decline is the greatest. We're seeing that now, unfortunately. Something else you emphasize is reading investor psychology. What's your observation of investor psychology over the past few weeks? The important thing to note is that in recent years, the markets have been ruled by optimism. People have thought things are going well, that they will continue to go well. People have also thought that since they need returns of six, seven, eight percent a year and uh, safe bonds were only yielding uh, two or three, that they had to make risky investments uh, since the S&P reached its high on uh, February 19th. The psychology has flipped. And uh, this, this moment when the psychology flips from optimistic to pessimistic, from belief to disillusionment is a very painful thing. It brings, as you can see, very substantial losses. It saps the market of optimism and prepares it for, I think, uh, a, a substantial uh, move downward. How do you remove emotion from decision making in investments? Because so many people have that herd mentality. When others sell, when others panic, I do so as well. Is that just part of yes. human nature? Well, it very much is part of human nature for most people. And I would say uh, that uh, I'm unemotional with regard to finance. Uh, hopefully I can still express a positive emotion toward my family members. When the times get tough, when the news in the world is very negative uh, and the, everyone around you is panicking, if you hear the same news and you receive the same stimuli, can you avoid panicking? It's a difficult question and I don't know the answer to that, uh, but clearly, if you are governed and ruled by the same emotions as rule everybody else in the herd, then you cannot do any better. So one way or the other, you have to try to distance yourself from those emotions. I only don't know whether it can be done. How 
Howard Marks is as well known for his investments as for his investment memos, where he shares insights about his investment philosophy. So how did he go from research analyst to a pioneer, a billionaire investor? And what's shaped his investment wisdom? Howard Marks describes himself as unemotional and a congenital warrior. A prolific writer of books like The Most Important Thing, whose memos are read by the likes of Warren Buffett, Howard studied economics and finance, later turned his investing and research experience into founding Oak Tree Capital in 1995, an alternative investment firm now with $125 billion in assets under management. We know that you grew up with a mother who was advised against extreme behaviours. What were you like, Howard Marks, as a kid? Uh, I think I was quiet. And um, I, I remember reading a lot between uh, age, let's say, six and ten. You know, like many boys in school, um, I, I was a little lazy. Uh, my mother told me I was an underachiever. And, um, you know, fortunately, when things when I was in college, and as you probably know from, from your readings, uh, when I became uh, a student of uh, Asian studies is really when I clicked as a serious student and started to enjoy it more and get more out of it. The fact that you did a minor in Japanese studies, how did that affect your investment career? In, in uh, Japanese philosophy, there's a concept called mujo, which uh, basically talks about the impermanence of things, the changing nature of things, the difficulty of controlling things. You can't uh, bend the river. It, you know, it taught me that there are things beyond my control and beyond my knowledge, and that the key is to, uh, to deal with them uh, effectively. You know, I, I, I consider that one of the most positive influences that I was fortunate to enjoy. So how do you exercise your mind and interpret information? We know that you love blackjack and poker. Is it game playing? Is it lots of travel? Is it talking to lots of people? You know, reading is extremely important. I read a lot, the newspapers, several newspapers every day, um, uh, books, uh, both investment and business and non-investment. Um, I try to speak with uh, people that I can learn from. Uh, I have spent time as a uh, trustee of my university, the University of Pennsylvania, and of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, where I'm now chairman of the investment committee. And uh, so I, I, I speak to people who are smarter than me in areas that I don't know about. And that stimulates your mind, of course. And, um, and you mentioned uh, blackjack and, and uh, backgammon and so forth. I think it's terrific to uh, play games uh, and uh, the, you know the beauty of gambling is that it gives you practice uh, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with risk, um, uh, understanding when the risk is on your side and when the risk is against you, understanding when to increase your bet and when to drop out. And these are these things are all uh, extremely relevant. Uh, to the process of investing. And interestingly, many of the excellent investors that I know uh, uh, are poker players, uh, bridge, gin, uh, backgammon, blackjack. Uh, I think that these things uh, uh, can help a great deal. And by the way, uh, the youth of today don't have exposure to those games. They're playing video games uh, and uh, never uh, games of chance. So I would uh, urge them to do so. Games have played a bigger part in my life than you probably know. From my early days as a boy playing old maid to late nights devoted to poker at the fraternity house, and then my discovery of backgammon and gin rummy, I've always been fascinated by games. Not all investment transactions are as dependent on luck as those on the Vegas Strip. The games that most resemble investing are those where hidden information, skill, and luck are at play. In investing, it's not a matter of what you buy, but what you pay for it. That is, not just a matter of picking favorites, but also figuring out when the odds are on your side. Or should I just say, good luck. Three factors can help us win games and increase investment returns. Hidden information, skill, and luck. 
How do we improve on those fronts, especially luck? I mean, you've said that you're the luckiest guy on the planet. Is that just to make us all feel mad? Well, of course, uh, you can't make yourself lucky. All you can do is prepare to be lucky. Uh, I'm lucky. I've been granted some great opportunities in my life uh, to invest in high yield bonds in 78, to uh, invest in distressed debt in 88, to invest in emerging markets in 98, to invest in the uh, defaulted subprime securities in 2008. Um, there seems to be a theme there. But I mean, I've been I've been given opportunities, but I also took them. Uh, there was a Roman philosopher, Cicero, yeah. who said what I think is one of the great things that anybody has said. And he said that the thankful heart is not only the greatest of all the virtues, but it is the parent of all the other virtues. I feel I've been lucky to be born in America in the latter half of the 20th century to parents who who treasured education. Uh, your listeners may be lucky to have been born in China at a time of China's emergence and growth. As Cicero said, puts us in a good mood, makes us a, a happy person, uh, a person that people want to be around and people want to deal with. And it permits you to be generous with other people. And uh, so many things uh, start out from being appreciative that I think that I always want people to do that, and I hope that your uh, listeners will do it too. Many signs are pointing to a global recession. What do astute investors do to get the odds on their side? One of the great questions in the world is China's future. I believe that China has a bright future. So let's talk about your Asian plans. Uh, recently, Oak Tree Capital became the first foreign distressed debt manager to set up a wholly owned unit in China, and that's amidst the coronavirus outbreak. What's the game plan? Well, I've been uh, visiting China and we've been operating in China uh, since approximately 2006, 14 years. Uh, I've seen the, the changes in China over that period of time, which have been uh, fantastic. I think we were helpful to the uh, uh, municipal office of uh, Shanghai in designing the QDLP program. And I imagine that our success with that was one of the factors that permitted us to become uh, the first uh, US firm uh, with a uh, license to invest uh, wholly owned in, in distressed debt. Oak Tree is increasing investments in emerging markets, especially Asia. The rationale behind that? I think that, that the Asia is the center of growth for the world for the next decade or so. Uh, and so we, we have to be there and we want to be there and we will be there. We, we enjoy great relationships with the people. I can't uh, tell you how much I enjoy my uh, uh, annual uh, two weeks in in Asia. Um, in addition, uh, I've been recently invited to uh, join the Shanghai International Financial Advisory Council, which I did uh, last summer. I've joined the board of directors of Duke Kunshan University, which provides education uh, in in uh, in the Shanghai area. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is an area to have uh, increased involvement in the years to come for me and for Oak Tree. Thank you so much, the great Howard Marks, investing great and also co-founder and co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. It's really been a great pleasure to be with you today.